Welcome. We're going to start our first of two interactive panels. Um, the first is <laughs> operation. Uh -huh. <laughs> Opera Operationalizing CAR T. <laughs> it's been just two days of tongue twisters. <laughs> Where to begin when building a practice with the newest modality? On our panel this morning, um, we have a wonderful, wonderful group of SCCA staff. Um, Rowena Fish is our Associate Director of Revenue Cycle. Madeline Grant is our Director of Public Affairs and Pair Contracting. Stephanie Mays is the General Counsel for SCCA. Erin Mullane is an Advanced Practice Provider in Intake. Jeff Ritan is our Service Line Manager for the Immunotherapy Program. And Carrie Stricker is our Associate Director for Quality and Regulatory. And she has um, helped us put a lot of important things in place for the, for the program. So you guys gave us some questions from yesterday. Uh, the panelists had also put together a series of questions uh, based on their experiences and in different venues. Uh, but we also want to invite you, if there's a burning question that comes up while we're um, and during the next uh, hour and 15 minutes, please feel free to come up to one of those microphones, and we'll be happy to let you ask your question. So I warned these guys ahead of time that I wasn't necessarily going to go in any particular order, um, but I will start with, um, this is probably going to go to Jeff. What are some important obstacles hospitals may face in bringing this therapy to patients? Thank you, Terry. Uh, I think that from a, a, a program perspective, um, I think system. So I, I think for um, hospitals getting into this and bringing this therapy forward, uh, uh, the uh, system complexity and the coordination is, is probably the top um, obstacle to confront. So we, I created a, a slide that looks similar to one that our uh, peers from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering put up yesterday in terms of sort of a system view. And at the outset, um, when we were, oh boy, the feedback, I apologize. Um, the outset, when we were uh, looking to bring this forward in our own setting, uh, we had to really characterize and understand where are all of the services uh, that uh, our patients on uh, clinical trials for cellular immune therapies um, taking place and what are all the key uh, groups involved. Um, so uh, I remember early on in our work, we, we created what we called a spaghetti diagram, uh, which essentially showed activity flows from the time a patient comes into our system uh, in intake all the way through when they uh, uh, ultimately are discharged and uh, uh, go into active follow-up. Uh, and the flow through our intake group, through uh, uh, financial clearance, getting a patient into the outpatient setting, um, treatment services for assessment, uh, labs, imaging, um, transversing over to the inpatient facility for unplanned admissions or planned admissions, treatments, follow-on care. Uh, it ended up being a very convoluted uh, uh, diagram with a lot of different directions in a very decentralized model, and, and it gave us a pause to consider how we could uh, organize and scale uh, to support the emerging research. I think other obstacles, uh, at least in our environment uh, and other academic centers, is um, some of the submodalities. So CAR T cells we've talked about quite a bit, but also uh, yesterday we heard reference to T cell receptor trials, uh, uh, TIL trials, tumor infiltrating uh, lymphocytes. Um, multiple indications, disease indications, hematologic malignancies, solid tumors, um, uh, diversity of trial designs in our pipeline, different ways uh, the protocols were uh, set up as, as well as um, protocol requirements. So all of those things I would consider um, a diversity of services and a diversity of requirements for delivering uh, these treatments. Um, one other thing I'll mention, and I'll pass the baton, uh, is um, some centers uh, may already have an apheresis and cell therapy infrastructure, some may not. Uh, that's a, a, a major consideration in terms of investment. Also, if centers are doing investigator-initiated uh, uh, trials, clinical trials in cellular immune therapy, um, uh, some may also have a, a GMP manufacturing capability, and uh, it's a major undertaking to create those for the actual collection of the cells, for the handling and processing and storage of cells uh, appropriate to regulatory requirements, and then also the actual manufacturing steps. So um, 
those are things that come to mind first and foremost. So there were other questions raised as, as we're on the issue of obstacles um, around the contracting and finances, both for the institution and for patients. So I'm going to look to that end of the table. Go ahead, Ron. The, the process to um, get the patients approved th through their insurance. So I think um, going into it, we realized there was a lot of unknowns. Um, and so we originally thought this work would make sense to have our transplant financial clearance team work through these um, authorizations. Um, but we quickly realized there was um, a lot of differences and uniquenesses to this therapy. So we developed a team um, within our clearance department to uh, specifically work through the financial clearance process for the CAR-Ts. And um, as we were learning, we were also learning the insurances were learning. So um, there weren't many policies for us to follow as far as insurance policies and processes. So we just learned that um, there was a lot of education on both ends, um, our team and also the insurance company. Um, but we've started to work through those and policies are starting to be developed and, and things seem to be room, uh, running a little bit smoother. Um, so I'll talk, pass it on for the contracting piece. Yeah, so um, uh, my team, the contracting team, sort of picks, picks up um, where Rowena's team leaves off uh, and we work with the payers to ensure payment. So um, one of the things that I think we've, we were all aware of is, is how um, high the price of these drugs are. Um, and so they really break the model uh, in a lot of ways uh, of the traditional contract. So normally we, we might see patients um, and, and have arrangements already in place. Uh, the market generally, I think, is taking a, a wait and see approach on these things. And so um, we're, we're doing single case agreements for every patient, which as you can imagine is a um, timely and laborious process. And it's sort of like a mini contract negotiation with every new patient, I would say. The other thing that's um, different about this is that because the therapy is so new and there are so few centers offering it, we see a greater number of patients who um, don't, you know, maybe don't live in the area and we're not already contracted with. Um, so for each of these patients, it really is kind of a, um, an intensive process to uh, ensure that we have the, the contracting in place. Um, so once uh, pre-off is, um, is uh, once we have prior authorization in place, um, our team then kind of picks up and works with the insurers to ensure that we have uh, payment arrangements in place. Um, and I think, I don't know how to. Ah, there we go. He's got it. Is it? Oh, should I speak further away from it? Is that okay? I think it's it might be too close together. Oh, okay. Um, That's better. All right. Um, yeah. So uh, you know, I think we're um, you know we're a couple years away from having established uh, contracts for these services. Um, in particular, I think uh, most feel like it will go in the direction of bone marrow transplant, where we'll see. Um, you know, standalone agreements for um, for these kinds of services. But in the meantime, um, working on a case by case basis, which uh, so far uh, I would say um, has facilitated access for all our patients. So, as you're building a program, how do you um, start to set up best practices in planning, in intake? in getting these patients in and pathways to care? I think that's a really good question. Obviously, we're learning as we go. I think what we've learned is we've begun to bring in a lot of the key stakeholders early on to kind of look at what we think the patient flow will be, make sure that representatives from intake, from apheresis, from the clinic, from finance, I mean, everybody that they're all at the table so we can work through to try and figure out what the best pathway is going to be for these patients. We are constantly looking at what we've come up with to see if it's, if it's working, if it's efficient. We're all learning. 
Um, for patient intake, I think one of our biggest challenges right now is there's just options, and for so long we didn't have those options and we were limited to maybe one or two clinical trials, and now we're lucky enough to have several clinical trials to offer these patients, and now we also have two, possibly three commercial products. So we're trying to figure out what's the best product, trial, CAR T cell for these patients to get, and how do we do that? I think that's one of the probably biggest challenges that I think my group and intake is facing. And I don't know if I have the solution yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Erin. Okay, next. What are key steps in building a cellular immunotherapy program to address the growth of clinical trials and commercial therapies? Thick. <laughs> I, I say the easy ones. This for you, one I, owe, I, I actually prepared for because it's a couple years worth of effort. Um, here's how I put it together. Uh, I think initially to build a program from scratch, if you're depending on where a center is starting from, it's critical to have someone dedicated to actually do some assessment work. Uh, I make the plug for that because that was me in our environment. Um, but I think that uh, every center is going to start from a different place, obviously, and I think that it's just a, a key uh, step to have some dedicated uh, resource to do some assessment work. And, and in terms of the assessment, it's really evaluating um, if you have clinical trials open, um, where are those uh, uh, services being provided? As I was describing earlier, um, we, early in our evolution, had a CAR T cell trial uh, with uh, patients being served on our bone marrow transplant uh, service. We had a, a TCR trial with patients being served in transplant, and then we had a, a tumor infiltrating lymphocyte trial that was uh, patients on metastatic melanoma uh, in a disease clinic. Uh, and then also um, receiving inpatient uh, treatment and our hemonc service. So a fairly diverse uh, set of um, uh, clinics and services involved. Um, had to get to know the stakeholder groups uh, across both the clinical side but also on the, on the uh, administrative departments and, and their involvement. We did a lot of workflow mapping, service mapping. Um, we had to do, uh, so understanding that current state, current landscape, uh, I think we also needed to know the vision of where we wanted to go with our program. Uh, and in our environment, that was really to be able to provide a, 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 a patient treatment infrastructure and also um, you know, provide for uh, innovation and research and be able to translate new trials into our environment and do that in a manner that was scalable. Um, so we had to make some predictions uh, for the future, project out what our uh, research pipeline would look like. Uh, out in the future, very difficult work that I'm still trying to get better at doing. Uh, and then ultimately we brought those pieces together, where we were today, um, where we think we wanted to go, what we were projecting in terms of future um, service utilization and requirements, and do some gap analysis to say what is it that we actually need to build, what resources do we need to add, um, what, uh, what physical infrastructure might we need to build out in order to grow uh, the effort. And then I think um, uh, there was quite a bit of time also spent on developing what the appropriate model of care is for uh, these uh, modalities, and I call, I call it you know CAR T cells, but also the other engineered cells. Um, what is the what's the best delivery model, and what's the most scalable delivery model to be able to support these in the future? And then obviously at the end of this effort, it was to go to our leadership and say this is what we think we need to do, and this is how big we think it's going to be and to gain alignment and support for uh, building the program from that point forward. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. What are some of the legal aspects that should be taken into consideration when uh, bringing these clinical trials uh, in, into bearing and FDA-approved therapies? That's a great question. Um, one of the things that we grappled with is that uh, of course, we, the drug is extremely expensive, where the CAR T cells um, are very expensive. And uh, as you're negotiating with the manufacturer, uh, who often has uh, a payer agency that they're working with, there's an issue of payment. When is payment due? Uh, what constitutes acceptance of these cells? And uh, when are we as an institution going to have to pay that money? 
um, acceptance in some of these has been differently defined. Is it when we receive the cells at our cellular therapy lab and then we ensure that the packaging is perfect? Is it when it's transfused into the patient? So there are a lot of um, gray areas around that piece. And certainly as you tell a patient, once you agree to have these cells infused, uh, and that's at the onset, mind you, that's not necessarily when they're in the hospital bed, but once they agree to that, at that point, they and their insurance is on the hook to pay that. So you're trying to stair-step um, different parts of the process. So for example, um, if the manufacturer tells you the payment is due uh, on infusion, well, if you get a patient ready and uh, it turns out that the patient really isn't um, able to accept those cells right then. So maybe you actually received the cells on day one. On day 15, the patient's still not ready. On day 30, the patient's still not ready. When is that payment due? So you have a lot of conversations with the um, manufacturers of the CAR-T to try to get your contract uh, so that you, the institution, aren't left holding the bag for this enormous amount of money. Thank you, Stephanie. Carrie, what are some of the uh, key quality and regulatory issues that have been faced in standing up one of these programs? Thank you. Um, I would say uh, the fact accreditation is the foundation for um, making sure we're able to deliver these cells um, safely and effectively to our patients. So we've been fact accredited since um, 2000, 2001 for HCT and recently fact um, expanded um, the umbrella to immune effector cells, and they left that um, term broadly on purpose. <laughs> so we've been um, trying to figure that out. That's just not CAR T cells. That's the TCR cells that um, we saw yesterday and NK cells, and um, so we're trying to figure all of that out. But um, implementing those immune effector cells and then showing integration of the programs and having SOPs and policies and all that kind of, those kinds of things. Um, and the next level is, um, I would say, the um, creating a immunotherapy quality dashboard so that we are able to um, monitor um, the safety of our patients and delivering these products safely to them. Um, things like um, number of ICU days um, and the toxicities and those kinds of things. And thirdly, you heard this a lot yesterday, is the REMS program. Um, which stands for Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy, and that's required by the FDA, and that's for each product. So as the FDA is approving all of these products, they are requiring a REMS program, and that anyone that prescribes, dispenses, or administers these products are trained on, um, on this REMS program. And the reason they have the REMS program is because the black box warning for cytokine release and German neurotoxicities Basically, it's to mitigate the risks, make sure the benefits outweigh the risks. Um, and so what they kind of left out there was the monitoring piece. It's not um, spelled out by the FDA that, those th um, that monitor these patients, but when you think about the people who are at the bedside, like some of you are, that are actually monitoring these patients actually after those cells are delivered for cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity, um, we realized our nurses that not only are administering these cells, but that we'll be seeing these patients also need to be trained. Um, so Dr. Rodriguez, I'm not sure if she's still here, but she mentioned yesterday that um, quite re Kite required uh, in-person training and we were less successful in negotiating <laughs> um, <laughs> not doing it in person. So, uh, and Dr. Maloney mentioned, we've trained upwards of <laughs> three, 400 people. There were a lot of um, midnight trainings and um, on-demand trainings and weekend trainings, and um, and we're still we're still training. Um, and so now the Novartis product is um, uh, we're getting ready for that, and uh, so we're looking to do put that into more of a um, LMS or learning management system for the appropriate people. Um, to, because it, the in-person is not sustainable. As um, Dr. Maloney was talking about our, the Seattle Juno product coming on the market, I was kind of shaking a little bit, like, oh gosh. 
Um, so, and that's not going to be the last one, right? We're going to see more of these. And so we um, are really, uh, the kite one was kind of like, how are we going to do this? Let's, you know, go. And we, the first um, step in that was deciding who needed to be trained, um, who's prescribing, who's dispensing, right? As um, Helen Marshall talked about, what does dispensing mean with this living drug? Um, so it was meeting with all the leaders of all the groups and then figuring out who are these people? What are their names? Not just, oh, the APPs or, oh, the nurses. It was then we needed their names. So um, figuring out all of, all of that and um, backing up a step, you have to have an authorized representative. And so uh, that is different at every center. Um, some people have it as the clinic manager. Um, we have it that, that in our quality department. We feel that is the appropriate place because this is about patient safety and regulatory. Um, and so uh, there's one designated authorized representative that is um, kind of uh, um, sanctioned to go forth and do the training in um, conjunction with the, um, someone from the, uh, the company. So the medical science liaison or the account manager can also be the, um, one of those people that is also training. Um, so I would say going forward, we're going to be looking to see how we uh, can put those trainings um, more readily accessible and a more sustainable model into like an LMS or an online um, system. So is that, is that into? Great. So Carrie, you bring up a good point. Uh, it takes a village. Oh. And these, these products aren't just outpatient, they're not just inpatient, they yeah. go across the continuum. So what are some best practices in establishing and improving cross-departmental communication? Um, having Jeffrey Tan. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not kidding. I think um, having, like he said, not only having that person that can do the assessments. I think um, Lindsay Palomino also mentioned yesterday that you know Jeff was kind of right there beside her. Um, and I just think, as you've heard, all of us. There's only um, six of us up here, but you'll see tomorrow. Um, or not tomorrow, I'm sorry, later on, that there's going to be six more people up here talking about the clinical impl implications. This is multi-departmental, multi-institutional, multidisciplinary, um, includes the physicians and administration. So I think um, Jeff has been key, um, that program manager, manager role has just been key in um, maintaining all of that uh, um, communication across um, inpatient, outpatient, administration, and physicians. And, um, and so I've partnered uh, a lot with Jeff. Um, usually if I'm informing him or he's informing me, um, kind of just knowing what's going coming down the pike, he knows what's going on as far as contracting, um, when um, things might go live. And so um, we can kind of put together a timeline together. So um, yeah, just a little plug for a program. Thank you for the plug. <laughs> Uh, um, well, and, and, and to flip that around, I think it's, it's, it's the, the department leads, so, so Carrie, Rowena, um, uh, Aaron, and others um, um, being available, and, and um, also I think pulling together huddles and meetings. I'll, I'll give you a good example. So Aaron Mullane over here runs a meeting weekly where we have myself, um, Aaron, uh, uh, our uh, cell therapy uh, team, our, our GMP manufacturing group, all together to sort of map out patients coming into the system. I think um, uh, MSK talked about that a little bit yesterday in terms of sort of bringing groups together and sort of real time sort of understanding people coming into the system and all the scheduling dynamics. I think we would be remiss if we didn't talk about how complicated the scheduling for these patients. I mean, being a patient, I can imagine it would be very daunting to look at a schedule and all of these events. And, and we're in the background trying to figure out how do you land somebody in a, an available slot on a trial that then will have a manufacturing component and we have to have them collected by a certain time. They really need to be treated quickly and, and our medical director saying, can you do it faster? <laughs> um, because we need to. And so I think um, that's just a, an example of how we have to pull together. I, I think it would be wonderful if we had more technology solutions that could get us out of sending so much email. Um, certainly on the commercial products, it's been the bane of everybody's existence because we really want to have each time point um, communicated and, and maybe we'll find some more technological solutions with our IT partners over time to, to make that easier. Um, <clears throat> but we're, right now we're in the mode of over communicating and that's with the clinic, with the other departments to make sure that we uh, 
we don't drop the ball in between us. So. Any other thoughts on that one? Yeah, I'd be happy to jump in. Um, it's sort of like they say, um, everything you need to know in life you've learned in preschool or kindergarten. It's the use your words. And so, you know, as, as Jeff said, the focus on communication and, and really over communication probably in, in some ways uh, in the beginning. Um, and, and we've, we've um, tried different things, you know, SharePoint sites. One key um, point of communication is between um, our team on the contracting side and Rowena's team on the prior ops side, both of us working with insurers on different pieces of the puzzle. Um, so some of it's trial and error, but a lot of it is really just um, keeping those uh, communication channels open. Um, and then, uh, you know, to, to again uh, emphasize Carrie's point, um, Jeff being our secret sauce, um, he, he also pulls us all together. Um, on a semi-regular basis to say, okay, how have things gone, um, and what are some process improvements that we can look at to continue to improve the, um, the communication and the, the systems that we're building. Thank you, Madeline. I'm gonna remind the audience again, if you have any, que any questions that you would like to ask, please come up to one of the microphones, and we're happy to get that question answered for you. for Montefiore. I guess a two-part contracting question. Um, with the commercial payers, how much have you gotten reimbursed as far as the product itself, the 373000 and the rest of the hospital stay? And then how have you been doing with um, Medicare and the Medicaid HMOs? Yeah, that's a, um, that's a good question. Uh, I'll start with the um, with the government payers, and so uh, I would say, you know, Medicare is, in a lot of ways really drives um, drives the the market. Uh, so they're a really important payer for us, um, and and a lot really I think remains to be seen about reimbursement in general. Um, one of the uh, one of the uh, in my job I work with our commercial payers, but also with our government payers, and I work on policy issues with our government payers, and so we've spent a lot of time ourselves and also working with different um, association groups um, to try to help Medicare think about how do we pay for these drugs because they really are, um, as we've said time and again, unprecedented in their cost. Um, so uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, have agreed to pay for these drugs, but there's some question about how they will pay for these drugs. And so right now we're in the process um, of working with them through a um, laborious commenting, uh, regulatory commenting process to, to determine that. So we're all sort of holding hands and trusting that it's gonna work out in the end, but I think that there are a lot of details that need to fall into place. Um, and I think really uh, on the government side, um, they've signaled that yes, we intend to pay for these therapies, but we're really looking at ways um, that we can be a little more innovative as opposed to just using sort of the um, the same old reimbursement um, paradigm. Uh, so I think perhaps in the short term, um, you know, we will see standard reimbursement, but I think longer term, they're gonna be thinking more creatively about how we might reimburse for these services. Um, on the commercial side, you know, I would say um, in a lot of ways it's, it's similar. And I think the market just is, um, it hasn't quite solidified yet. So if you were to ask me about reimbursement for bone marrow transplant, I could say, you know, most of our bone marrow transplant um, we do on case rates. Uh, you know, we there's sort of a, a set bundled price for these services, and it's all inclusive over a certain time period. And you know, you might have outliers, and if that's the case, you know, you'll have a floor or a ceiling to protect both the um, provider and the insurer in extreme cases. We're just not there yet um, on immunotherapy. It's so early. Um, we're still learning so much about what the variation and cost will look like. Um, so I think it's a bit early uh, to be able to have generalize, generalizable things that we can share about reimbursement, particularly on the commercial side. Thank you, Madeline. So what are some key patient access challenges for patients getting on CAR-T therapy? There's several. Uh, I think we see a lot of people who are from outside of Seattle, so I would say proximity is an issue. 
this process is often two to three months where people are staying here. We want them close to our center. There are side effects. We never know when those side effects are going to occur. Sometimes it takes a long time for people to recover after treatment. So I think it's very challenging, especially right now there's not a lot of money available to pay for housing. So that is something people have to consider. How do you relocate to Seattle for two months? How do you do that? Where do you, how do you find a caregiver who can also take off and be with you for two months in Seattle? That's hugely challenging, especially for a lot of our younger people who they're young, they you know, otherwise would be working, they have families, and so looking for a caregiver, those caregivers have those same challenges. They're working full-time jobs, there's kids at home that need to be taken care of. So people are making huge sacrifices to be able to undergo this therapy, and I think we would love to be able to provide more resources and be able to allow more people to access these services. I think the insurance sometimes can be a bit challenging. We're still trying to figure out what works, how do we do this fast and efficiently. But there's still some people who can't always access this therapy, especially getting approval for the commercial products has been somewhat sometimes an issue and we need to give them more information. Um, I don't know, that's probably it. Insurance piece on the, um, so Aaron mentioned about the housing um, being sometimes a barrier, and we're finding that the payers haven't really caught up. Similarly to transplant, where they often offer a benefit to cover travel and housing, we're not seeing that quite yet with um, the immunotherapy treatment. So that certainly is um, is something that can oftentimes um, cause some delays with our patients just trying to figure out that piece of it. Um, and then also um, a lot of the narrow networks that we're running into. So um, the out-of-state patients um, that we were attempting to bring in sometimes just don't have the option because of the networks that they have, um, that their insurances have chosen. So I'm gonna add on to that and I'm looking at Stephanie. So uh, there's, there's a fair amount of the rumor mill um, nationwide. Um, institution X offers free housing, institution Y, you know, has deals with, with hotels, and there's always this concern um, of what we can and cannot offer our patients, and how do you see that evolving, or do you see it evolving ever, and what are the limitations? The limitations are based on the regulations. There are fraud and abuse statutes and anti-kickback statutes, pretty boring topics, really, <laughs> but um, in essence, um, the government has said you can't pay or create inducements in order to get a referral. So Center One says we'll give you free meals, uh, two months of housing, and it's all free if you just get your CAR T done here. Uh, the other institution says, wait a second, we can't do that, and they report institution number one. And there are a lot of um, countervailing arguments you think this is really great for patient care. We would love to be able to provide free housing and, uh, or at least assisted housing to help patients um, be in a position where, they, where their housing and those other sorts of temporal needs are not a factor in making their decision. We are, our hands are quite tied uh, based on a number of CMS regulations. There are some areas that we can give and we can certainly take into account those um, patients who qualify based on financial need. But we have to be pretty careful about doing that. I don't see the government uh, making a lot of accommodations in that arena. In essence, the government's view is all of you uh, providers have an eye toward getting a bottom line for your institution and you're willing to do whatever it takes if it's providing free care in order to induce other higher paying uh, providers to come or um, sorry, payers to come. Uh, that, that's, the, that's the lens through which they look at our providing free care. So we have to be pretty careful about that. Thank you. Okay, how are negotiations with payers and compensated care affecting a patient's ability to be treated with these therapies? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I guess I would say, uh, I think the system is, is working as intended. So um, 
really the negotiations with payers um, at the end of the day are facilitating access for these patients. Um, that said, I don't want to minimize uh, how much work has gone into this um, uh, and how tricky it's been. Um, you know, one of the things that we did that I think um, has been really, really helpful is we had conversations with payers early on before we had any patients. Um, and so we reached out to all of our major payers in the area um, and we spoke with their executives. We connected them um, uh, with a number of our folks, including um, Dr. Maloney, our, our medical director. And we explained um, to them um, the promise of immunotherapy and we answered any questions they had. One of the um, key participants in that as well was Dr. Eaton, who you just heard. He was um, obviously offered a really um, important perspective, I think, to payers. And there was some skepticism initially where I think some of them were thinking, is this even something that we want to cover? You know, is this, um, this incredibly expensive drug that offers um, maybe marginal uh, value over existing therapies? And the answer to that is, is no, this is actually for some patients um, truly a breakthrough. And so I think we've seen most of the um, insurers come around and you know, agree that it is something that they want to cover. Um, but given how expensive it is, as you can imagine, there's a lot of scrutiny on it from, um, from the insurer side, um, as, as there should be. Um, you know, that they want to make sure that they're, um, you know, uh, being efficient with how they use their resources. So those early conversations, I think, were really helpful to sort of set the stage for when we actually started receiving patients um, because those connections were already made, uh, and we'd, you know, we'd sort of planted the seeds um, early for how we were looking at um, being reimbursed for these services. Uh, and then, you know, one of the other things that's been really helpful is having really clear um, deadlines, and this is where the communication uh, piece comes in, and really working with folks um, really all across this table to have clear visibility to what the clinical deadlines are, um, what the deadlines are uh, that we're working with, uh, um, with the manufacturers of this product, um, and then building back from those to uh, having the contract in place in time. So uh, I'd be lying if I um, said that there weren't nail biters or um, instances where you know things were challenging, but I do think at the end of the day, um, uh, we're all trying to achieve the same thing. The providers are, the, the insurers are and ultimately the patients, right? We wanna make sure that this patient gets the therapy that they need in the time frame that they need it. And so having that as sort of the North Star um, and trusting that your pair partners have that as well, which I, I have largely found to be true, um, is ultimately what I think helps get some of these uh, challenging uh, negotiations across the finish line, finish line in time. Thank you. So we're gonna switch back to quality. Uh, Carrie, what were you, you gave us an overview of, of how you dug into the REMS program, but before, and we're about to launch another commercial therapy, what are your thoughts on implementation, and what, have you, what did you learn from the last one, and what are your thoughts as we go into the next REMS imp rollout? Um, I... Um, Identifying the authorized representative and where the appropriate place um, for that to live is. Um, also, um, things that I learned was we were kind of just in go mode. How are we going to do this um, with our first product? Um, and so I was kind of doing these um, individual training sessions. We did group chat group sessions as much as possible. Um, looking back, if we were um, going to continue with the in-person, I would have had an online system where people could um, register and sign up for um, planned out sessions going into, uh, um, you know, a month ahead or two months ahead. We took a, um, the approach that, um, and as I think many people would, be, would is um, patient care is first, obviously. So I, we literally were... Um, just, I, I would sit there and wait for the for the um, nurses to come, you know, at their lunch, so that they could continue with their care. I think 
Um, so I, 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 that's one thing that I would do differently is kind of have more um, set up training sessions. We also have the complexity of different sites for our inpatient and outpatient, and so that was a little challenging. But I think the defining which area that is going to be in, and again, that's different at every center, whether it's in the quality department. I'm sure um, Karen Anderson has met people who it's the clinic manager. Um, I, I don't, I think the qual for us, it's in the right place. Um, I also have um, an excellent team. I have a quality, quality management associate who works with me who um, we, have to, we have to maintain documents, um, uh, record of the dates of trainings and all of um, that kind of stuff. So she um, is able to keep track of that. Um, and the other piece is uh, identifying personnel. We have to report all of uh, ad all adverse reactions to the FDA. And so, um, kind of implementing that process on who is going to be doing that, who is going to have oversight, who is going to be confirming that this is the, the right way. So um, we're learning, as you're hearing um, from all of us, um, and a lot of it is by trial and error, um, or not error, but trial and, oh, we're not going to do that again. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, you know, we started reporting adverse reactions to the, to the, um, to the company as an individual, you know, grade two CRS, and we got, you know, five pages of queries back, and I had flashbacks back, back to my research days. Um, and so just deciding on how you're going to be reporting adverse reactions and to whom, um, so I think identifying personnel, identifying methodology, like I mentioned earlier, um, in person versus learning management system, identifying who, um, and then developing policies and um, SOPs. So that's something else we've done is started developing policies for our in, within our quality department on how we are going to re be reporting adverse reactions. Um, now that we're launching our second product, developing a process for our REMS program, like so that as these more products come into place, that we have a little bit more of a standardized approach now that we've learned um, after our first product. So um, it is not a small undertaking. Um, so I think that we were, we, none of us were ready for, <laughs> we were like, what is this REMS thing? I think, you know, here, here you go. So, um, and then I think when we were, um, it all kind of uh, sat with us a little bit. Like, I don't think um, the companies or the FDA realized that these patients could touch so many people in the course of their care. Um, and I think we wanted to take a conservative approach in training from our, um, when we put on our patient safety lens. Um, so I, yeah, just understanding it's not a small undertaking, de de defining which department, writing SOPs and policies, uh, maintaining documents, and um, so. Thank you, Carrie. You're welcome. Jeff, I'm gonna toss it back to you. We've got a couple questions about resources. Okay. So if, if someone wants to start one of these programs brand new, where would you point them? What resources might be available? Uh, I, I think that uh, there's no substitute for talking to people who've gone through it. So uh, going in and networking and, and um, talking with individuals in uh, organizations that have undertaken uh, moving into this space. I think also participating in uh, professional associations. Uh, uh, example would be NCCN uh, has had some um, uh, educational opportunities and also uh, um, some content uh, in that area and they're uh, uh, moving in that direction more. ASBMT is another one that's had some uh, uh, recent forums. So I think sort of availing of, of opportunities to uh, uh, go out and, and look for resources at, at those types of uh, associations and institutions. Um, but I, I, like I said, nothing really would um, uh, uh, give you a better perspective than just speaking with some uh, uh, some centers that have gone through it and, and, and potentially some centers that are starting from a similar place. Um, centers that may be more academic uh, from the research perspective as well as those that uh, have stem cell transplant programs uh, certainly would be places to look, I think. 
uh, for resources and support if you're starting from ground zero. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. Rowena, there was a question yesterday from the audience um, around cost and advocacy. What can providers do and what do you feel that we're doing well at SCCA to minimize the, the cost and, and really the, the work of the prior authorization and getting patients to care? It's a good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I think um, our approach is to really make sure that um, we're doing as much as we can at our center for the patients, meaning um, really handling all the interactions with the insurance company um, and really trying to keep the patient out of that part of it. Um, as far as um, out-of-pocket costs, um, that's a little bit more challenging. There's not as many resources and um, uh, opportunities to help with the out-of-pocket cost per se. Um, we had talked about the travel and housing being a barrier. I think also um, if a patient does choose to come to our center and they're not in network, um, that could certainly be a large um, expense for the patients. And, and we do our best to, to, um, to get them um, uh, set up with any sort of financial uh, resources that are available, but at this point, there's, there's, not, um, there's not a whole lot um, currently available for our patients. Thank you. Carrie, back to you. How do you stand up fact programming and accreditation around one of these uh, programs? Can you, I'm sorry, how do we? So FAPT yeah. accreditation, yeah. Um, standards and SOP development. Who are the stakeholders and how do you get to implementation? Yeah, so we have um, what we call, it used to be our transplant clinical operations team and um, showing integration of that. Um, we, are, we have a separate clinic, our Basil's Family Clinic, but um, a lot of the SOPs are um, either taken from or revised from our transplant team, so it's, we now call it TICOT, our transplant and immunotherapy clinical operations team. So um, what we do is we have a FACT task force, um, and that's a multidisciplinary team um, of our quality team, both from Cellular Therapy Lab, myself, our um, CNS, our um, Karen Anderson from immunotherapy, and also transplant to review the, um, the 6.1 version for FACT had the 28 new immunofactor cell standards. We literally went through each standard one by one and um, looked at kind of where the implications were. Like, okay, that's cellular therapy, or even though they're in the clinical program, they may impact, um, uh, speak to the clinic operations piece or um, contracting, actually. Um, so we go through, our fact task force goes through each new standard, and then um, each, uh, standard is identified, an owner is identified for each standard, and then those ones that really require SOPs and new policies then um, are made to be developed uh, and taken to that, uh, our TICOT, our clinical operations team, where some of the policies are reviewed. Um, we always look to see, do we have an existing policy that can get updated or existing SOP that we can pull from and that just needs to be edited, or is this something that really needs to be created? Um, so, uh, one of the examples for um, the immunofactor cells required um, guidelines for management of CRS or neurotoxicity, and it actually um, is what drove our institution to develop our own standard practice guidelines. So you heard Dr. Maloney talk yesterday how um, Kimariah has their REMS program and their guidance, and um, and uh, Yaskarta has their own REMS program and guidance, and then our institution created our own standard practice guidelines. But that was a fact requirement. Um, and, but although it was a fact requirement, um, it really was a great opportunity to pull our physicians together and um, get them kind of all on the same page and in agreement in how we were going to treat our patients. So um, that goes to a different um, committee for our standard practice guidelines, but that's just one of the processes that, um, or some of the processes that we uh, took to implement the, the standards. So, um, and um, the new seventh edition came out, so we're just constantly uh, um, Iterating on all of um, on all of the SOPs and policies, and um, there's more to come. So, thank you. 
So I'm going to throw this out to our panel of experts, and I'll ask each of you to speak to this um, based on your area of expertise. What are common misconceptions that people have about implementing cellular immunotherapy programs? And what would you recommend um, as an action to combating those misconceptions? I'll start. Um, I think one common misperception, and I, I can't remember if this came up yesterday, I think it did, um, was that, is that access is going to be similar uh, for um, the, the first couple of FDA approved therapies as it is for other types of uh, uh, approved therapies. And, and I think ultimately um, combating that misperception is challenging, and I think it, it, it suggests um, some transparency around uh, things like the financial hurdles involved, um, the complex systems uh, that have to be set up, and, and the specialization, uh, and that, you know, really it's, it, it, there aren't going to be, uh, in the near term, uh, as many um, places to get these types of therapies in clinical trials and or these approved therapies. Uh, and, uh, and that may expand uh, over time, but there are, as we've talked about earlier in this discussion, there are barriers to that. Uh, so I think just making sure that um, people understand that uh, um, it's, it can be challenging um, to uh, find uh, local or, or proximal uh, centers that have these um, uh, options and uh, try to um, communicate transparently about what some of those uh, limitations are. Okay, I'll go next. So somebody doesn't steal my idea. <laughs> um, I think it's important to remember that medicine is a practice and it's not the um, perfection of that. And so that plays in in that you want to make sure that the consents and the consent process that you walk through with a patient really articulates to them that this is a great option, but it is not a guarantee. And that really comes in with the money because it is so expensive. And certainly we've had some patients come back to say, you know, if this doesn't work, do I get my money back? Well, um, no, that's the hard truth. And so you want to make sure that those who are touching the patient really have the hard conversations about um, what this really is, what that consent process is. Again, part of the acceptance process um, with the CAR T cells and what the patient has to sign off on is once they agree to it, um, we will bill for it. And that can be a hard truth, you know, so how do you really manage that? So there are some delicate conversations that you have to have, and you just want to keep refining those, keep going back to your consent forms, ensure that they really are um, stating what you want them to stay, and also remembering that consent is not a form, it's a process. So really working with the patient as well as the patient's family. And I think um, there are certainly situations where perhaps the whole patient's family, maybe some of them, but not all of them, were in complete agreement as to what needed to happen. So it's important to include the as many decision makers around the process as you can. Um, <clears throat> so I think uh, maybe one misconception, or maybe it's more of a miscalculation, but <clears throat> pardon me. I um, I think uh, you know in, in speaking with some of my um, colleagues at other centers and sort of you know, the things we heard, I think when these um, therapies were initially approved, uh, a, number of, um, a number of us were thinking that, you know, overnight there would be hundreds of patients coming for these products, um, which was simultaneously thrilling and terrifying. Um, uh, and um, we haven't quite seen that materialize, uh, at least overnight. And I think one of the lessons is really that this is a this is a much longer process and there are a lot of things that need to play out and it's probably okay that it's happening a little more slowly than we anticipated um, because it allows us to, uh, to really work out all those process flow issues that you've been hearing us talk about. Um, and so I think there are a whole lot of things in the market um, that need to, to settle um, and to crystallize and we're gonna continue to see new products um, come through the pipeline and you know hopefully, um, you know, the optimist in me says, you know, not only new products to treat these diseases, but 
to, to treat other kinds of cancer as well. Um, I just think that instead of it um, happening overnight, it's gonna happen over uh, many nights. And so the question is, how can you build um, your system and, and ensure that you're putting the appropriate pieces into place um, to grow as the, as the science grows? I'm gonna give a patient safety perspective on that also a misconception is you think FDA approved, um, these must be really, really safe um, for patients. And um, that's not necessarily the case. We've seen some awesome efficacy um, and some results with these products, but um, there's clearly a REMS program for a reason. Um, there's still severe toxicities with these. So I think just in general for the public, you kind of think, well, it's FDA approved. It must be okay. Um, and we still have an obligation to make sure that this we're delivering um, safe care to our patients and that we're mitigating some of these risks. Um, one other, it might, might not be a misconception, but um, maybe a miscalculation on my end. I've been in oncology for almost 15 years and at um, SCCA, and then when I stepped into this role and discovered fact, I was like, who knew? Um, the, I, the regulation and the regulatory piece around this and the chain of custody around these cells, um, you know, from the point of leukapheresis to the point of it getting into the patient, um, you know, this is a product that is being sent somewhere and then being remanufactured, and then it is these patients' own cells, you know, so making sure that someone gets their own cells back. Um, you know, so just the regulation is just, I, I think that um, if you're disconnected from it, uh, you may not be as aware of some of the regulations. And so I always love when I have people who are in intake or um, in our uh, clinic who just come to me as a consultant with questions like, is there any fact regulation around this? You know, so, um, but I just think that could be a mis misconception or miscalculation or just not um, something people might always think about is just kind of the regulation around a lot of this, so. Clarence perspective, um, I think um, one of our misconceptions originally was we could just fold this easily into our transplant um, process, um, but, it, but one of the items that Stephanie mentioned was um, consent and, and um, financial costs. Uh, so we, we learned that there's some specific training that our financial coordinators needed in scripting in order to be able to communicate to these patients um, really what the, the financial um, possible uh, burdens could be. Um, and so that was new and different from transplant. And um, I think the other thing that we, we went into um, believing that this was going to be um, a really challenging process from the prior authorization perspective. And surprisingly, we've actually found the opposite. So um, there is um, some light at the end of the tunnel from that perspective. Let me just follow on on one thing that Rowena said. <clears throat> one misconception that we've encountered um, is, um, you know, there are some similarities between immunotherapy and bone marrow transplant, similar patient populations, um, some of the steps in the process are similar. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, in dealing with um, payers in particular, you know, there have been a number of payers that have said, well, great, this is exactly like bone marrow transplant, let's just treat it as such. And so, um, yes, there are some similarities, but there are a lot of differences as well and some really important differences, um, you know, particularly in this um, management of the side effects of these highly toxic drugs. And so that's also been a big education effort that we've had to undertake is um, to show where those parallels exist, but also to highlight the important differences and what that means um, for the patient in their care. I think being realistic about the timeline, and everybody touched on the pre-off, the contracting, we talked about the consent process, but allocating enough time to adequately educate these patients that it does come with risks. What are those risks? What is the recovery process like? Allotting for the time to get the pre-auth, sometimes we get feedback back from the insurer looking for very specific clinical information, that takes time. Being able to schedule with the manufacturer to get that spot, the time to manufacture the cells. So I know for me personally, I deal with a lot of the referrals and that a lot of the physicians and providers think we should be able to make this happen quickly. These are sick patients, they need treatment ASAP, but the process takes time and being able to slow down and remind ourselves that we shouldn't rush, 
rush through this process that, you know, we really do need to spend time with these people and educate them on what this therapy is and, you know, allocate for the time to get the clearance so we're not putting stress on our contracting department to really give everybody enough time. Thank you all. So, time's going quickly. I want to give the audience one last opportunity to ask any questions that they would like to ask before I toss the volley back to the, to the panel with one last question. Going once? All right. So, we're going to start with Rowena and work our way down. You have one pearl, one piece of advice that you can give someone starting a new program. What would it be? Oh. And you, can, you can think about it. You can take a minute. OK. Because um, <laughs> we've covered a lot of ground. I think the collaboration with all the different departments within the organization, um, that was key. Um, just the, the education, the collaboration, how these patients will touch all these different areas. Um, I think all the work that we did up front um, and continue to do uh, has really led to a lot of our successes. I'm glad I get to start. <laughs> I, would, I will just definitely <laughs> second that from my experience. Um, I, I think that's uh, absolutely true. So you're lucky you went first because you got the good one. But um, I would say from my perspective working with payers, both commercial payers and government payers, um, uh, engage early, engage often. And so I, I spoke a little bit earlier about, you know, we, we did some proactive outreach and we kind of had a little road show. Um, you know, we talked to the, um, to the state health care authority that oversees the Medicaid program and the um, state employees. We've had conversations in D.C. with policymakers um, and uh, with legislators as well, and then with individual commercial payers. Um, and I think it it, um, it's really invaluable to have um, those established connections um, to ensure that you all are coming from a, a similar level of understanding about, um, about the product uh, and about the value it brings to patients uh, and about the importance of, of reimbursing it so that we can protect patient access. You know, the tagline of Seattle Cancer Care Alliance is better together, and so I'm going to go on the Me Too uh, bandwagon here and say it really is important to do this together. Um, you can't negotiate these um, contracts with uh, Novartis or Kimrai or any of these without involving the uh, folk who are working on consents or your finance team or your management team to say, you know, where's our breaking point? If we aren't paid, um, uh, until, or sorry, if we do have to make this payment now and just hold the cells, and if the patient can't get them, what will the financial impact to our bottom line be? So you can't do it in isolation. You really do have to work as a team with every um, aspect and uh, attend a lot of meetings. It's important. I hate to agree, but I do. Um, <laughs> and I think we, we found out that, you know, at times you don't think that other other groups need to know that information, yeah. but we would, you know, mm -hmm. you end up having somebody like Jeff who is seeing things through across mm -hmm. the entire program and you learn something from one group and realize that that's affecting, you know, another group that could be far, you know, far separated from whatever that process is. And then I would also just say really thorough education for these patients and taking the time to do that um, in regard to you know, what the product is, what to expect along each and every step, what the side effects are, you know, the stress on caregivers, all of that, just doing a really thorough, in-depth dive with these people and not rushing that process. I'm going to echo what everyone else said. I think the, um, and I've already said it too, the multidisciplinary, um, cross-functional um, piece of this, you know, we have our intake team emailing our team, our quality management associate, um, because we know that's on the front end. But we need to know um, because we're on the we're on the back end, going to be reporting these adverse events. So, um, just understanding that whole flow um, and all working together that was key um, from a quality and regulatory perspective. Um, speaking to the REMS and being successful in the training is getting the key stakeholders and the leaders of. Um, of all of those areas engaged early 
on um, so that when you're reaching out to uh, the staff that you have their buy-in and that they know that this is really important training and required training. So um, you're not just coming in sideways and saying you need to do this training, but knowing, engaging um, the medical director and um, associate medical directors, whoever their leader is, um, and that that message also comes from them, that this, uh, um, education is not only required, but really important. So um, those, those would be my... Uh, what they said. Uh, plus, um, uh, I can't say one thing, so I'm gonna say like three, sorry. Uh, one is, uh, um, I think, uh, partnering with the folks at this table and uh, uh, many others who are here from SCA and from the Hutch, uh, a lot of strong leaders, and I think that having that sort of underlying leadership across all of the different groups and departments, uh, and then how that leadership gets exemplified as we pull together and and, and build this in process is, is a is an integral piece. I think the other thing is the whole takes a village metaphor, um, but then building the the structure for the for the village to to come together, and I think the facilitation um, over time is critical. I think it's, it's, it's just, there's so many different pieces and parts that having, having some of those central organizing principles and structures, uh, and it, that's really academic sounding, but it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the, the glue that holds the thing together and, and helps it scale and move forward. Um, happy to talk more about that. It, it, it is a little bit philosophical, but it, it works. Thank you. So I want to thank our, our panel, um, and I hope everyone's gotten something out of the, the, the information that they've shared. And on the theme of Better Together, I will say that I feel incredibly fortunate to work with such a wonderful group of professionals, so thank you. <laughs>